Simon, uh, from my perspective, mm. uh, LATE and NATE, these were kind of just weird acronyms that <laughs> my parents would be spouting at home. And of course, yeah. I didn't get to see any of this mm. stuff until sort of way, way into the sort of uh, into my thirties, yeah. really. So I'm 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 a, I'm a Johnny come lately, yeah. really. Now you've studied right from the beginning mm. the origins of the London Association. Mm. What was it called for the teachers of English to start teaching off? of English? No, it was a society of teachers of English originally. And yes. Somehow they found that somebody else had that. There is another organisation somewhere in London, whether right. it's extant or not. And the basis of this, if I've got it right, is that this is I use a funny word, a self-help organisation. Mm. This is a group of teachers saying what can we study as classroom teachers about our practice and what are we doing? So in itself, that's quite, I won't say revolutionary, but mm. it's, it's quite a powerful reform, yeah. the attitude that teachers can do it for themselves. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? So tell us about those early years. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, it was, uh, it was 1947. It was post-World War II, post-Butler, uh, new kids coming in the system, teachers who'd had very little training, many of them, particularly in London, lots of very new teachers. Uh, finding themselves with types of kids I hadn't seen before, a grammar school curriculum was what existed, and teachers that I've spoken to that were there at the time simply said that, that we just didn't know what to do. And that mood was picked up clearly by people at the Institute, like Jimmy Britton, uh, Nancy Martin, Pascal Gurry, and they just called an open meeting, and a hundred, over 100 people turned up. And they, they instantly took this model of saying, okay, well, it's not going to be a sort of policy-making forum where we sort of write a curriculum and hand it down. Uh, it's going to be a discussion group, it's going to split into study groups, uh, split into networks, teachers will focus on topics that they're finding challenging, try stuff out, bring it back to the group at a meeting, share their findings, take it on to the next level. So it was a, you know, it was a rudimentary version of action research that was going on to promote a new kind of English teaching, but it wasn't, the design wasn't we are going to create a new English teaching, the design was we are going to help each other teach English effectively with the kids that we're now working with and have a model of English that isn't an old school grammar curriculum but is something that is working for children, the types of children that are in school now. So it was very much that, it was very much a kind of necessity, uh, but clearly the people who were coordinating, coordinating at the Institute had that sense that if it was going to be effective it had to be teachers working in their own classrooms with their own concerns, addressing their own problems and coming up with solutions themselves and in collaboration with other people. So, and and what what sort of you give, give us a sort of, you know between say forty seven and yeah. oh I don't know the end of the fifties say what well, what sort of topics were coming up who, who what sort of people were they inviting what kind of commissions were set up well lots of different ones they initially split into seven study groups they had an, an assessment group they had a spoken English group they had a curriculum group. Uh, the first major project they did was about the marking of imaginative composition. Really interesting topic. because We now call creative writing. Well, yeah, exactly. And how, how do you value it? And how do you actually assess a child's story writing? How do you balance what you might say as the technical accuracy of it against the affectiveness of it or the, you know, the creativity of it? Uh, so they did a huge project, that study group, and they went into seven different schools, trial trialled a, a whole range of short little uh, creative topics with children, they wrote, they brought you back, Jimmy Britton wrote a very elaborate mark scheme that they tried to apply, but then the teachers ranked them all to see if they ranked them in the same sense, their kind of holistic version of which ones were the best and which ones were the worst, and then put them against the criteria. It went on for about three or four years, they published a very large report, the basis of which was they hadn't really solved the problem, but I don't think that was the, the, the point in essence, it was about researching that. But as well as doing, the interesting thing about late was as well as doing these kind of very classroom based focused research projects to try and improve teaching, they were also passionate about their subject. So they would also hold evening meetings and weekend meetings where they would invite poets or speakers uh, from universities to talk about aspects of subject knowledge if you like, which were probably often far removed from texts that they study themselves in class or to children, but it was about their own kind of enhancing their own knowledge and their own learning. So now this is crucial isn't it? Because yeah. you know we can look at any professional group yeah. and, a, and a narrow view of it is that the only thing they should be doing is, is if you like some kind of quick feedback, a sort yeah. of a biomechanic loop mm. back to the classroom yeah. Yeah. and that that's going to solve things. Mm. The idea that a teacher is a human being and yeah. has to lead a life yeah. and that indeed that there's a whole hinterland of activities related to their subject, which in this case is English, yeah. where they could explore and see yeah. what happens. Now that's, that again, you know, I won't use the word revolutionary, it's, mm. it's, it's, 
it has it's a powerful reform isn't it yeah. because it's suggesting well why don't you read a poem yeah. as it were you know yeah. it doesn't have to have anything to do with yeah. the children students that you're t- yeah. speaking to yeah. uh, working with it might be just good for you because who knows it may at some point mm. come back to practice or it may make your life more bearable so you can go to work on monday yeah exactly that uh, and, and you know if you talk to douglas barnes he'll point at his poetry shelves and he'll say you know a lot of that stuff i was introduced to through late they'd have a uh, whole uh, evening seminar series through the autumn term and they'd study the work of modern poets that, again, would not be used in the classroom, but would be enhancing their own sense of themselves as professionals. There were conferences where the evening would be spent listening to different pieces of classical music as part of a kind of cultural weekend where they explicitly said within programmes, we are going to forget about the horrors of the classroom for a weekend and we're going to go away and we are going to indulge our passions and indulge what we enjoy. But clearly, underlying that was a sense that it will actually enhance themselves as both people and practitioners when they go back into the classroom. And as you say, make them think, yeah, I can now face this on Monday morning. Now, let me throw a spanner in the works. Yeah. Between the 40s and the late 50s, yeah. was late dominated by grammar school teachers or were there secondary modern teachers in there as well? And then when the switch came, particularly in the LCC, the Old London County mm. Council and then IDA, to comprehensive schools, yeah. did it then bring in or create, if you like, a, an environment for comprehensive school teachers as well? Well, it, it, I mean, the first membership list is absolutely dominated by grammar schools and grammar school teachers. There are some of the very, very earliest second experimental secondary models, like Peckham, uh, there's a representative from Peckham in the first membership list. And then as the other first comprehensives like Woolworth and Holloway open up, they are involved as well. But the, the actual bulk of the rump of the membership is absolutely grammar school teachers through the mid-50s up to the end of the 50s, certainly. And at that point, end of the 50s, you, you can sort of see the balance shift and you see the nature of topics that are being covered shift slightly. So they picked up some work by John Barron Mays, I think his name was, who wrote a, a PhD and then a book of English in oh, Education of Urban Children, and that became a conference, and then they explicitly ran then uh, Harold was involved in this uh, a course on teaching in a comprehensive school at the back end of the 50s, early 60s. So the, There's the, a change. Yeah, yeah. the shift happened, and it happened, yes, at the b- very back end of the 50s. But the, the sense that the comprehensive ideal was important was there at the very beginning, I think, because when John Dixon was involved, he'd been in Holloway where they'd been experimenting with a comprehensive curriculum, uh, and he came to late with that notion already there. And his question was always, what do we do with the curriculum? in a school where we have the full ability range and that was his kind of driving idea or ambition to try and get from late. So it was there, it was bubbling away, but actually the reality of most people's working environments was still grammar schools probably up to the end of the 50s, yeah. But that's yeah. where you see the shift coming from. Now, and now let's get the transition from LATE mm. to NATE. Yeah. So now we've got a national association, it comes together. I can remember a sort of vague domestic explosion about mm. this at the time, not yeah. to say my mum and dad were arguing about it, but that uh, there was a lot of toing and froing, and, yeah. and I, th- I, th- I had a sense um, that Harold uh, thought that something was not being lost, but mm. that certain ideals were not held sacred yeah. in Nate that had been held sacred in late. Mm. I don't think I'd ever understood what he was on about. Yeah. So, uh, what was this transition, and what was involved? Well. <laughs> There was a, a late had helped set up other branches in different parts of the country, so there were a whole range of, there was Bristol, there was Bait, there was Bait, there was a, in Birmingham, there was a whole number of them. There were also a group of use of English groups that had come from the Journal of the Use of English, which were associated with Levis and the model of English teaching that had come through Cambridge, if you like. Uh, and there was a call to make to form a national association, they didn't want to do it themselves. They went to a meeting with the uh, education minister at the time, I think Boris Ford, his name was, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Uh, and at that meeting, they agreed to form a national association, and then the argument was what form of body that should take. And the, the view, it seems at the time, was there was a, a, a voice from the use of English groups, uh, Frank Whitehead and Dennis Harding and those sorts of people, who were saying, we need a policy-making group that's going to talk to policymakers and being at the, you know, the very centre of how curriculum and assessment is driven in this country. Now that is crucial, yeah. because any self-motivated group of teachers who are doing it for themselves, they have to decide at some point or another, are we just doing it because yeah. we're meeting up, or are we wanting to knock on the doors of whatever it is, the DFE as it's now called, yeah. and various other names in the yeah. past, is that, 
is what is our role? Yeah. So that's that's crucial. We must hold that in our yeah. heads, mustn't we? Yeah. Yeah. The opposing view. I'm not saying it's not so diametrically opposed, but the the view from late was, you know, we are formed of individuals on the ground who join together in groups and pursue concerns, research, campaign on issues that we find are important, rather than responding directly or in the business of creating policy at that level. So that that was the critical point of the argument. How how we constitute? Are we uh, an organisation that's made up of branches, and those branches feed up into a, a central committee, and that central committee reflects the concerns and the wishes of the branch are only a central managing committee that then sort of feeds down some sort of wisdom from the top. And that seemed to be the point of uh, confrontation and uh, it seems that in that argument it was uh, very, it was the voice of late that won the argument really because they were coming with a, a very strong membership base and a very clear model and 17 years worth of success and experience whereas you know, late was embryonic. Lake could draw on this this model of you know nearly two decades of saying well this is how we worked and this is what's been effective so that argument seemed to win the day but there seemed to there was a payoff of some description because the first chairs of Nate were Frank Whitehead Dennis Harding had come from the use of English side of things so this it, I, it's a bit difficult to pinpoint exactly whether there was a kind of a restaurant moment where there's a <laughs> payoff done but it seems there was a compromise uh, but that central. The constitution certainly sort of enshrined this idea that we are representative of our members who are working together in regional branches, feeding into a national executive who reflect their concerns. Now, various times I've attended NATE conferences, mm -hmm. and some of the most powerful moments, and these are also reflected in conferences I've attended in Australia, New Zealand, America and Canada, mm -hmm. of English teachers' associations. Yeah. And for me, the most powerful moments are not uh, the great set pieces, mm -hmm. the great plenaries and, uh, and so on, they, yeah. they're the workshops. Yeah. They're groups of teachers getting together, you know, with their whiteboard or whatever and saying, this is what I've done, or teachers sitting around sharing practice of one form mm -hmm. or another, um, and sometimes engaged in producing something, yeah. putting on a play or yeah. making a video, yeah. or um, what have I been involved in? I know, but the wonderful, late, great Terry Staples, um, we, we put on a, a little play, I remember, mm. that was based on something. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've taken part in many of these. And so this tradition, and, and that was there way back in LAT. I remember yeah. my mum coming back from one of the conferences with a poem in her hand mm. that she had written over the weekend yeah. and was very pleased about. So that right down, I mean, what can you call it? It's, it's kind of down and dirty in the sense mm. you're doing exactly what the students might do yeah. or would do, or alternatively teachers sharing this is what I did. We explored this story mm. and this is what happened. And look at the transcripts and people hand out transcripts of what the school students or children, mm. quite young children, some have been saying. That tradition, if you like, has survived and persisted and it's going mm. on and it has, it's, if you like, it's uninterrupted, 1947 yeah. to 2015. That's, yeah. that's all going, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's still going on. Uh, it's probably... Well, what's interesting is that in, in the, let's say, in the past, in the 60s, certainly it was the 60s and 70s, that kind of work was happening, but there was a sense in which the organisations late, but particularly late, were taken seriously at a policy level, so they would be involved in consultations and they would play a major part in big projects like Language and National Curriculum, National Aussie Project, National Writing Project, so NATE would be a body that would be gone to to be involved at those very kind of high level, uh, you know, developments of policy. And well, that takes us to our next section. Yes.